and we'll invite you to make your opening statement. Thank you. Thanks so much. And um, thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, like James, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, many, many of you from Etobicoke Center and, um, and, and, and uh, many, many friends and people who I've worked with over the years. So thank you all for being here. Um, and, um, and I think uh, like James, I have to say that I'm like, I'm honored to be here because for a number of reasons. One is because there's so many folks who I know and respect on this call. Um, and secondly, because uh, so many of you I've had a chance to meet with and speak with about the issue of climate change and protection of the environment. I know how knowledgeable you all are. And so I know you wouldn't spend time here today um, if you didn't want to have, uh, if you didn't think that this was a valuable discussion. But I also know that many of you aren't just participating in this meeting that you're advocating in other forums. Many of you have met with me, written letters, written emails, called me, um, and sent acts on the issues that are priorities to us. Um, before I continue, can you hear me okay? I know my connection isn't stable at the moment. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. so far, so good. We're losing your video just a little bit, but um, uh, we've heard everything so far, Ivan. So please uh, continue. I'll, I'll continue. I'll, if, you, if you continue, I occasionally have this problem. So if you, if you continue to have problems, please flag it for me and I'll very quickly switch to a different connection uh, as a backup. Um, so, uh, so really, thank you again for all for being here. Um, you know, uh, uh, a number of months ago, about a year ago, I was speaking with a constituent and this was at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And uh, she had asked me to call her about an issue that was of concern around the pandemic. And as we were, as we started to chat, um, she asked me how I'm doing. And I said, I'm fine. I said, it's a very busy time because a lot of people need help right now. They're struggling, right? They're struggling. At the time, if you all remember, we were struggling to figure out how we we're gonna protect people from COVID. We were learning a lot about it, but also people were losing their businesses and losing their jobs and everything else. And so this was at that very outset. And so she said to me, well, you certainly, uh, and I, and I said to her, but I said, I have, you know, I ran for office to make a difference for folks, for people. And she said, well, you're certainly getting your opportunity. And I kind of feel the same way that she did, uh, she did about COVID, about climate change. Like climate change has been a problem for a long time and we've got a lot of work to do, but I feel like this is a period of time that is so critical, so pivotal, especially here in Canada, making sure that we do what we need to do to meet the targets we need to meet, protect our environment, fight climate change successfully. I think the next, these years are pivotal. And so I'm really proud to be, uh, to have that opportunity to work on this along with James and many others and with all of you. Um, so in, in being asked to speak today at the outset, there were, you know, the, the, your team, the, the team of organizers sort of said, well, talk, if you could talk a little bit about some of the accomplishments. And I think that was mentioned in the, in the introduction. I, as James said, you know, when, when you think about climate action, there's so many dimensions to that. And so many, it's not just climate action we're talking about, protecting the environment. There's so many initiatives on so many levels. So I wanna highlight a few of them that I think you'll find interesting um, that are most relevant. Um, and of course we can build on that if there's other topics you wanna to talk about. So first off, I'm a member of the Standing Committee on the Environment and Sustainable Development. And so uh, that gives me an opportunity to work on this issue almost every day. Um, and so the committee itself uh, focuses on a subset of issues that the committee chooses to focus on. And, um, but that gives us an opportunity to work on some really substantive aspects of this. Uh, so a couple of the reports and studies that we've done are in the process of doing um, are studies on encouraging the production and purchase of zero emission vehicles. Um, we're, there's amendments that have been proposed to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. I'll get back to that. We had a study on, the, on, on single use plastics uh, as many of you uh, will probably know, the government announced that it's a ban on certain single-use plastics. So that's one of the things the committee is studying and scrutinizing. Um, and at the end of these studies, what the committee does is then recommends steps for the governments to take to advance that particular issue. Um, and so currently, our committee is working on uh, Bill C-12, which is the, uh, the government's Net Zero Emission Accountability Act. Uh, we're going through a process called Clause by Clause. So this is where the piece of legislation, we all have a piece of legislation in front of us and MPs from all parties have proposed changes to the bill, okay? And we're going through and deciding which amendments pass and which amendments don't pass. And all the goal of that process is to make the bill stronger. And so um, 
probably within a week or so, a week to 10 days, that process will be complete and we'll know what the new C12 looks like. But um, so that's a very exciting process that we're going through at this time. And, and to the extent I can, I'm happy to answer questions about it. Although I have to say that the specifics of the amendments that have been proposed are, are actually supposed to be confidential until that process is complete. So I can't go into a lot of the detail, but I can tell you a little bit. And I promise you, I'll tell you as much as I can, okay? Um, in terms of, so I wanna highlight a few specific uh, items that I think you'll find interesting. One is the government's introduced uh, a modernization to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. So on April 13th, uh, the government introduced Bill C-28. It's called Strengthening Protection for a Healthier Canada Act. It's an amendment to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Um, this Canadian Environmental Protection Act, I'll call it SEPA for short. It's actually a really large and complex law, um, and it, but focuses, the, the amendment that's been introduced focuses on two sets of amendments, uh, sort of recognizing a right to a healthy environment. That's number one. And you can imagine the implications for that across our society. Uh, and number two is strengthening Canada's chemicals management regime. So uh, that has not been updated for a very long time. And that's part of protecting our environment and our health. So that's a bill that's before Parliament at the moment and will eventually come to the committee. Uh, the big one that I spend the most time on that I know many of you will be interested in is the one I mentioned, which is C12. Um, this is a bill that, uh, if, if passed, would require that national targets and plans for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada be, uh, be in place. And the goal of this bill is really to meet, to achieve the goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Um, some key elements of the bill I'll summarize. An initial 2030 target has to be set by the Minister of Environment within six months of the coming into force of the bill, along with a plan on how to get there. Both, have to be, both of those have to be tabled with Parliament. And the a progress report also has to be tabled by 2027 on the progress towards the 2030 target. Okay, So that's one of the components of the bill that's important. But it basically legislates, we've got to reach net zero by 2050. It legislates that we have to set an initial target for, for, for emissions uh, for 2030. And there's a series of reporting requirements that, that are also stipulated. Um, and, and it also requires that emissions targets be set for the Canadian government of the day, whether it's this government or a future government, set emissions targets for 2035, 2040, and 2045. So what that does is basically, it, it means this government will set a target for 2030. It, we're gonna legislate that, uh, that this government or future governments, who knows who it'll be, will have to set targets in 2035, 2040, 2045, and we're legislating that zero by 2050. And then we're legislating a whole series of reporting mechanisms and checks and balances so that Canadians know how we're doing, where we're doing well, where we're falling short, uh, and it forces the government to actually lay out its plans for how it's gonna meet each of those targets and what it's gonna do if it's falling short on those targets. I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that essentially is what C12 does. I think that's a really important law, arguably the most important in environmental protection in Canada in, in my lifetime, uh, I would say, uh, because this is really what we're, this is really the mechanism by which we're going to require ourselves, hold ourselves accountable as Canadians to meet net zero by 2050. Um, the last piece is, it's not enough to introduce legislation, you gotta introduce the plans to back that up. Um, the, this government's plan for, for meeting, meeting those targets uh, as of now, and there'll be more that will have to be tabled if this bill's passed, is called a healthy environment and a healthy economy. And it's basically got five key components, um, cutting energy waste, okay? So that's cutting pollution, um, uh, making, uh, cu cutting pollution, I'll keep it there. Number two is uh, making, make clean, affordable transportation up and power available in every community. Number three is um, continue to ensure pollution isn't free, okay? Uh, right now we have a price on pollution, as many of you know, some people call it the carbon tax. Um, number four is build Canada's clean industrial advantage. So um, we need to make sure that we've got, uh, that clean industries are being supported, that they're growing. This is important not only to support a clean uh, environment, but also a strong economy and uh, embrace the power of nature to support healthier families. So that's protecting the air we breathe. Uh, making communities more resilient to extreme weather, et cetera. So I've talked to you about the committee. I've talked to you about C12. I've talked to you about C28. I've talked to you about the plan, uh, the, uh, the healthy environment, healthy economy. Uh, these are some of the highlights uh, that of, of the work that I'm focused on, that the government's focused on. There's, of course, more, but happy to get into that as we get into the discussion.
thanks again for having me. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Ivan. Um, those are great uh, concise statements and that puts us a little bit ahead of schedule as far as the agenda goes, which is great because that gives us lots of time for uh, questions and conversation. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, many of um, folks have already submitted questions by email. So we do have a, had a started preparing and sharing some of these. We also shared some of them with, uh, with the two of you. And um, <clears throat> as we also mentioned, it's possible to add further questions in the chat box and we're seeing some of those questions coming in <laughs> quite uh, rapidly. We'll try to, as I said, try to, to triage some of them and work them into the conversation. Um, if for some reason your question cannot be answered this evening or we end up uh, not dealing with your concern, uh, remember that you can always email uh, our members of parliament. Um, they have their government emails, so james.maloney at uh, parl.gc.ca and uh, ivan.baker at uh, parl.gc.ca as well. And uh, that's one of the ways in which we can uh, forward our concerns also. Um, I'd like to just, uh, and so as I said, we have a number of, of um, concerns and categories that we've already looked at, but uh, we just heard a fair amount from Ivan about uh, Bill C-12. So I think uh, maybe just a couple of quick follow-up um, questions on that. Um, and we'll ask those, we'll ask you Ivan to uh, respond to those. Uh, and one of the concerns that comes up several times, and um, it also came up in the chat I noticed, is that um, you know we set these targets to begin a little ways down the road, and, and you know we set a, a, a goals for 2030, but uh, you know that's still quite a long way away, and um, so so some people are wondering whether we uh, whether there would be a checkpoint say in 2025, and that we're a little bit more aggressive in setting these targets for ourselves. Anything uh, re in response to that? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, right? Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, is 2030 seems far away, but in the context of fighting climate change, I don't think it's that far away. Um, you know, if you think about what it takes to fight climate change, uh, it takes tremendous action by individuals, changes in behavior by individuals, by industry, by government, uh, governments at different levels. And so um, I think part of the reality is, is that the actions we take today certainly will bear fruit within the next four years, three and a half years until 2025, four years. But I think the reality is, is that where we can most make a difference is in the years beyond, to be frank with you. And so that's, in, I'm not saying we can't impact 2025, but I'm saying the greater impact is over the long term. And so that's one. Uh, so I think a 2025 target would, the other thing you have to remember is that I, I think of is the goal of, of this bill, C12, is to get to net zero by, by 2050. That's the, that's the goal that we've set for ourselves, uh, for the government set for itself. And so to achieve that goal, we're gonna make decisions this year, next year, over the coming years that will allow us to get there by, by 2050, hit the 2030 target, 2035, 2040. If we had, if we set a target in 2025, so four years from now, that is particularly difficult to meet. And that would be the inclination. If I'm going to set a target, I want it to be ambitious. One of the challenges, I think, is that it would force us to make decisions we wouldn't otherwise make that aren't necessarily the best ones in the long term, but they work in the short term. And, and I think, so I think there's a trade-off there that has to be balanced. If our goal is to meet the net zero by 2050, I think it's important that, that all our resources be put to, and, and energies and difficult decisions, frankly, be put towards that goal and the 2030 target in 2035 and 2040. But if we had to set, if we set an incredibly ambitious goal for 2025, which is four years from now, less than four years from now, we'd have to take some pretty drastic measures um, that may actually, sure, they, they might get us to 2025, whatever that target might be, but they could create tremendous harm for us over the long term, certainly economically, but also may not be the best way to getting to the 2020, to the 2050 target, the 2030 target, et cetera, right? And so I can go into detail as to what I mean by that, but you can imagine that if you want to meet a short-term target, you're going to make a certain set of decisions. And if you want to meet a longer-term target, you're going to make a different set, but they're not the same decisions necessarily. So that's part of it is we want to create that incentive to meet targets over the medium to long-term starting in 2030 and beyond. 
the last thing is, is that I do think that it's important though to hold ourselves accountable in the short term. Like we can't just sort of pass this bill, put out a plan and see you later and hope that the government does what it's supposed to do between now and 2030. And I think, I think so I think there's a balance to be found between what I just said and also holding ourselves accountable in the short term. And so I think what, what um, uh, as, and I told you that we were going through the committee, the environment committee is going through clause by clause on this bill on C12. So we're looking at amendments that could improve the bill. Um, and so uh, what I, I think what, what will, our plan is to, to sort of strengthen the bill um, with some sort of uh, an interim emissions reduction sort of objective, if you will. I won't call it a target because it's not exactly the same thing perhaps as what you'll see in 2030, 2035. I don't want to, you know, confuse folks uh, or mix, you know, mislead, but, you know, like with an interim emissions objective for, for you know, 2025, 2026, I think is something that I would support. I think a lot of members are talking about and hoping to support. So what that would do is hold the government accountable publicly because we'll know what that objective is to, to, to meeting a short-term target that's achievable, um, but not making a whole bunch of short-term decisions that are actually damaging towards our fight towards climate change in the longer run and, and, and towards our economy. So I can, hope I, that can, I add, can I add to that too? Okay, James. Yeah, I mean, look, your, your question is about timing. I mean, this is another thing you have to consider is the fact that governments aren't in this alone. Uh, the private sector are very much partners in this is this move forward. And so when people express concern, which Yvonne and I share about, you know, the uh, the pace at which this is going to happen, uh, you need to remember that um, just pick pick a sector and they are all driving this as well. So this is going to start happening more rapidly than than even we hope it does, is, is my view. If you take the auto sector, for example, uh, every single car, by the time that... Uh, 15 year old kids are my age or even Yvonne's age, you won't be able to buy a gas driven vehicle unless you're buying your grandfather's old car that's sitting in a garage somewhere. Um, so th this is happening naturally. Today in the House of Commons, I was, I've just finished reading an article in the Globe and, Globe and Mail. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court in a Dutch court ordered Shell to cut emissions by 45%. Shut, Shell had set a target, the court said, no, you got to reduce it by twice as much. Um, what th this is great. I just happened to be watching the, the Minister of uh, uh, Natural Resources speak in the House today. Exxon Mobil shareholders voted two independent board members in a rebuke of the company's climate efforts. So people are stepping up in the corporate world, in the private sector world. Um, you know, Suncor in Canada has now come out publicly and said they're, they're going to meet, you know, the uh, net zero by 2050 in compliance with our legislation. And keep in mind, this legislation builds in accountability. I know somebody put in the chat said, you know, what's going to happen if a subsequent government takes over? Well, they'd have to revoke the legislation. They'd have to change the legislation because there's benchmarks put in there and there's accountability legislated in there. So they're going to have to be uh, very proactive to try to change that. But what the minister said in uh, the House today, which is probably going to stir up some uh, emotion, if not, if not a lot of other things in the opposition benches, is after he went through these, this list of things, he said, yesterday was big oil's day of reckoning. You know, that's a pretty powerful statement coming, not from not from the Minister of Natural Resources, but or not from the Minister of the Environment, but from the Minister of Natural Resources. And this is the other thing, you know, when I was thinking about today and, you know, if you wanted to get answers to the questions, for example, that you, you'd uh, sent along in advance, uh, 10 years ago, you'd pick up the phone, you'd call the Minister of the Environment's office and they'd help you. Today, you have to phone every single department in government because every, every department in government has this on their mind. This is something they could, this is the lens through which they look at everything. Um, so it, it's, it's, we will get there. I'm confident we will get there. So uh, people, people have uh, every reason to be concerned and uh, perhaps skeptical that, uh, you know, targets are not going to be met. But again, look where we've come in the last 10 years. You know, and look, our government, our previous government, last time we were in power, we set targets and we didn't meet them too. So, you know, this, this isn't unique to uh, opposition parties. This has been all governments and everybody's to blame. But we are now at a point in time where people get it. The conservative, you know, Aaron O'Toole just introduced a, some sort of carbon pricing mechanism. Let's, we won't get into a debate about whether it's any good or not. But the point is, it's, it's a recognition by them. Like people, there's an evolution happening. So uh, 
but it's discussions like this that are helping the evolution take place too. So, yeah, people get it. Uh, I, as individuals, uh, sometimes we get it more <laughs> than uh, as communities together and as governments together and as corporations together and so on. Um, um, and it does. It's going to take a concentrated effort to <laughs> to work together. And uh, you know, our track record isn't that great, I suppose, when we look at the world around us. So. Um, it's good to have a strong um, forces directing us uh, in uh, at the government level, and and says you know some of us are going to be skeptical about that as well. So yeah. So anyway, and, that, and uh, that's not a bad thing either, by the yeah, way. Yeah. And uh, so so th thanks for those uh, those comments about timing and so on. Um, um, there is a, a lot of anxiety about uh, the. Uh, the time and uh, time passing and so on, but uh, we'll, we'll all keep that in mind. There is an there is another question raised about uh, Bill C twelve. Perhaps we'll just deal with that before we go to some of the other uh, topics. Um, and that had to do with the uh, the net zero Canadian advisory body. Um, and I, perhaps Ivan, are you uh, somewhat uh, familiar with that? And, can I take uh, Can I take this one if you don't you mind, Ivan? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And so I, the, concern, the concern is about the representation on that group and um, who's part of it and do we have uh, you know, enough uh, scientists on it and so on. I, I, I read, here's, so here's the process yeah. I went through. I read your yeah. question yeah. and I probably shouldn't say this because this is being recorded, but it's that, oh no, you know, who, because I, I wasn't familiar with all of the members who had been appointed. But I then went and, you know, I, I looked at the board, I looked at the mandate, but I looked at the bios of the members on the, who, who, have, been, who have been appointed. And I'm, <clears throat> I don't share the uh, um, skepticism, if I can put it that way, of, of the, whoever posed this question. In fact, I, I look at the bios of those people. Those are people, some of them, many of them actually have been openly critical of uh, the speed at which the government is moving forward on, on climate change initiatives. Some of them have been, have uh, openly questioned it. That's, I think, two things. One, it gives you confidence in these people's ability to perform their function on this board. But at two, um, I think it reinforces the uh, message that we're here sharing with you that this government is serious because we just didn't go appoint a bunch of, you know, you know, politically friendly, uh, non-expert uh, people to this board to satisfy the obligation. These are people, and almost, not almost, every single one of them, I went through all their bios, these are all very serious people who take this issue with, uh, you know, uh, incredible passion. And they've, many of them have long track records of fighting climate change and and uh, fighting governments on their initiative. So I've, I'm actually quite confident in the people that are, that are on that board. Thanks very much, James. That's good to hear. Um, so, Ivan, you said uh, there uh, about a week, and we have a revised, uh, the revised version coming out, or an updated version. Yes, I hope you won't quote me on the week timeline. I, I'm, I'm working off the top of my head on that. I'm, I'm new to federal parliament and parliamentary procedures. So, if the committee takes two weeks on it or whatever it is, I hope you won't hold it against me. But in the coming, in the very short term. Uh, what will happen is the committee will finish with the clause by clause process and that revised piece of legislation, the revised C-12, will go back to the House for final debate and 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 hopefully passage. Uh, so that's, but please don't hold me to the, to the seven day timeline. If I could just, uh, I don't, I know you want to keep moving, but what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm putting into the text chat uh, for everybody um, the, uh, the, uh, the advisory body, a link to the advisory body. And, and I think it's, it merits taking a look for those who are interested or concerned about that. Uh, James was talking about the qualifications of the folks who are on that. And in that, that link, you can find what James was talking about. It was, it was a brief bio. Okay, thank you, uh, Ivan. We're losing you again eh, uh, for a moment, but um, we've got the link. The link is in the chat, so we'll follow yeah. up on that. And we're looking forward to um, the uh, revision in the bill and then we're going to have a uh you know there'll be lots more to talk about can, in a can week i just two. can i just yeah. add a bit to that so so yvonne is right i mean 
setting a you know, promising a timeline in politics is a is a mistake we all make and always end up looking uh, like we you know it's it's dangerous because sometimes take happen things happen quicker sometimes usually things take a bit longer what's happening right now is that legislation just like in my committee and other committees every time a bill goes through once it passes second reading it goes to the appropriate committee so c12 in this point goes to the Enviro committee and then they go through the piece of legislation clause by clause by clause by clause mm. and every member on that committee has an opportunity to su suggest revisions or amendments or additions or deletions. And then, you know, if Yvonne makes a proposal to add or delete or amend something, every other member then has an opportunity to, you know, uh, add their input on whether they think it's a good idea or a bad idea or how it should be amended. So these things, you know, you can see the finish line and then all of a sudden it, it gets extended. So um, it could take longer than a week. It could happen next week. The important thing, one of the important things to take away from that though, is that, uh, again, you know, these, parli these parliamentary committees are very engaged and all parties are very engaged in this piece of legislation, as, as we know, and uh, there's amendments being put forward. But the government and the ministers made this very clear. He's, he's opening to listening to ideas from any member of parliament on how uh, they think the bill can be uh, improved. So I'm, uh, Yvonne, Yvonne knows more about it than I do, but I'm very uh, optimistic that when this bill comes out of committee, it's going to be a good looking piece of legislation. Well, we're looking forward to it. So we'll, we'll switch uh, to a different topic. And um, uh, in your statements, and I can't remember uh, which one of you mentioned it, perhaps both of you already talked uh, about uh, the jobs um, issue. And uh, it's one of the things, of course, that comes up when we start talking about transition in uh, our economy and uh, moving towards some um, uh, a green economy and uh, we're very very aware that this also involves uh, collaboration with uh, the provinces in particular not to mention uh, the private sector and so on so we'd like to hear a little bit more about strategies for the creation of green jobs um, and infrastructure in Canada and uh, I'm not sure which one of you would like to start on that one um, I can go ahead, James. Yeah, Yvonne. go yeah. ahead, Yvonne. Yeah. Okay, Yvonne. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, a, I mean, there's so much we could talk about in this category. I think, at a, let me start at a high level. My view is, is that, you know, there's a couple of areas where, categories of areas where, um, that, that need to be tackled. One is to, to address this issue of transitioning to a greener economy. One is, making sure that we're doing everything possible to develop um, industries, those green, that green sector, those emerging, that clean tech, um, those green, that green component of the economy that's rapidly growing. Um, and then, and then there's a second component, which is about helping workers or helping individuals and helping them transition um, to that, into those sectors that are growing. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to transition from a sector that's in decline to the clean tech sector, they could transition to an existing sector that happens to be doing well, but it's about figuring out, it's about mapping for me, where we, how those workers, in which industries are declining, can identify those opportunities that match their skill sets and, and, and then seize those opportunities. So there's a number of ways in which to do that. And there's a number of initiatives the government has to do those, do things within those two categories I just mentioned. Um, so for example, um, uh, there's, you know, when you look at the, um, when you look at the last budget, the 20, which came out about a month ago, which was introduced about a month ago, there are billions of dollars invested in a range of programs to support um, industry and grow in high perspective, clean industry. So for example, a $5 billion investment to something called the net zero accelerator, um, which, which, which is the purpose of that is to spur clean tech innovations, um, attract investments, and foster development of supply chain so that Canadian industries and workers can compete. Um, it launched last December, um, and the goal is really to transform sectors, so provide them with the resources to adopt clean technology and encourage innovation and, and to build infrastructure. Um, so that's five billion. Uh, there's a billion, separate billion dollars available for clean tech projects. Uh, there's a reduction, a 50% reduction in the uh, corporate and corporate general corporate and small business income tax rates for businesses that manufacture zero emissions technologies. 
A few other initiatives are also accelerating investment in clean energy technologies from the, by the government, um, uh, uh, developing and implementing in coordination with, with the United States and other countries, a set of codes and standards for retail zero emission vehicle charging and fueling stations, um, investing in the forest-based bioeconomy. I could go on, but these are examples of the kinds of initiatives that are in place to kind of spur industry. And then separately, there's investments in the last budget to help workers transition. Uh, so for training, uh, primarily for training or providing resources to government to help workers who are struggling to transition with help in, in identifying opportunities in sectors where they can't transition to. So I hope that's helpful. There's a lot there, but those are the two categories that I think about and a bunch of initiatives within that. If I could, I mean, what, one of the pro part of this, this issue, a big part of this problem, in my opinion, is perception. Because uh, the naysayers of the world throw this back at you like, okay, so the government's going to come in and they're going to impose all kinds of regulations, you know, to promote the green economy, which all it means is it's going to shut down the oil, oil sector and it's going to shut down all these other sectors. And all of a sudden, overnight, there's going to be millions of people unemployed. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's rhetoric, it's spin. We have to reinforce the fact that there are so many jobs available. If you go read that report I referred to earlier, there's all kinds of examples. Let me, let me give you a local example. A guy I know about 20 years ago, I worked with him back when I was a, a lawyer. He quit his job and opened up a business and he was going to help people you know, retrofit and green their buildings. And this was way before anybody was talking about this. And I can remember saying, looking at him and thinking, are you sure you want to do this? You've got a pretty good job right now. Like you're taking a risk and going into a space that is un at that time was unknown. Well, the guy was cutting edge and look, look where we're at now. Look what the announcement that happened today. So in this clean tech study we had uh, a year and a half ago, he came and gave evidence and he was one of many people who are doing this. And there is massive opportunity for businesses out there to for retrofitting homes, retrofitting office buildings, built you know in the construction industry. Take the construction industry alone. You can you you know green buildings, net zero homes, net zero buildings. All of these things pro provide massive opportunity. You want to talk about jobs? Um, you know the General Motors plant closed in Oshawa twelve months ago. And everybody was rightfully in a panic. Well, what's happened since then? Now you're just having an electrical electric vehicle, a truck plant is replacing it. It's not going to replace all the jobs, but it's going to replace a lot of them. Out in Oakville, you see you've got uh, the federal government partnered with the provincial government for an electric car facility out there. These are the types of jobs we need to be working towards. The green uh, green industries and the auto industry is the, a perfect example. Um, and there's, there's there's so many others. I mean. The, the point is that there's there's it's not negative and anybody who tries to spin it in a negative way needs to be uh you know reminded with facts that they're wrong and they just have to stop doing this and a lot of it is based on historical fears and i mean we get it every day when i talk to people and you know like there's been there's been uh, attempts by earlier governments provincially and federally to introduce green initiatives that haven't worked out and people always throw those in our faces look how much it costs it's just going to waste taxpayers money and it's going to cost money and it's never going to work you should let the private sector do it let me give you another example we've had and i'm not speaking out of school here we had um on the uh, recent study we did on critical mineral minerals the reason this is so important is because canada is is uh, rich in critical mineral resources, which are going to be used to build battery technology, which is going to be used as a fuel source for vehicles and other things, which is clean. And it's, you know, zero carbon. The, the challenge is, is that there's a big economic gap between getting those minerals out of the ground and getting them developed and getting them manufactured. And we want to make sure that Canada is going to be at the forefront of that worldwide because we're not just a you know a resource-based economy we're actually involved in the manufacturing of this green technology and it's the corporate side of things that are coming saying the government needs to step up and do this thing so this isn't just you know government handouts this is this is government partnership with the private sector and that's that's an important message too okay thanks uh, th thank you james um um I recently read something about a huge deposit of lithium somehow mixed in with the, uh, 
the so-called uh, oil sands in Alberta. <laughs> so maybe maybe something can happen there that the, those industries would intersect. But um, speaking of um, you know emissions and so on from oil and uh, and gas production, I mean that's still a, a big challenge for us. And um, I think that there's still a lot of concern that uh, you know much of our emissions come from that sector. And um, I think you did read the question and the stuff that we circulated about um, the Greenhouse Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act and uh, how that uh, <clears throat> um, how that intersects with the oil and uh, and uh, the oil sands and production in Alberta, um, not to mention in other sectors in uh, in Canada. Um, there's a lot of concern about, uh, you know, where this is all going and whether we can do enough there. Is there something you can say about that one? Which who'd like to start on that one? I could. Go ahead, Gene. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, look, I mean, that's the elephant in the room. I mean, let's let's face it. Um, the oil and gas sector is is everybody uh, looks there when we start having this discussion about big emitters, and it's a it's a fair thing to do but we need to uh there's a couple of points that need to be made in my opinion the oil and gas sector has been a driving force of our economy in canada for so long and we need to be grateful for that and we need to appreciate the people who uh who've been involved in that but we also need to and one of the other things i've i've, I've come to really appreciate through my committee work and natural resources is the oil and gas sector are highly motivated to work to move towards clean technology as well and people people forget that um you know the the oil and gas isn't going to be stopped consumption is not going to stop overnight um and there has to be a transition i see somebody says it has to be a just transition that's that's exactly right um, you, 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 you can't shut it down overnight. You shouldn't shut it down overnight. Um, if there is a way to, uh, move the industry forward, uh, uh, and, and allow them to continue being as innovative as they have been, uh, and look at the Suncor example today. I mean, there's a, you know, if you look at all of the big investment funds internationally, they're coming forward and they're saying, we're not putting our money in industries or companies involved in industries that don't have an eye on climate change, that aren't being responsible. And that's what, that's partially what's going to drive it as well. And that's, you know, you're, you're seeing that in Canada. So I know it's, it, it's easy to say, and it's easy to default to say, you know, we got to uh, shut down the oil and gas industry. And I know that the opposition likes to point at the prime minister and say, that's his goal. But I mean, all of these discussions have to be tempered. They have to be realistic. You have to look at, you know, uh, you can't do things overnight. The reality is, you know, if, if you go to the last time I went to the car show, which was last year, just before things shut down, every auto manufacturer, and I know I said this earlier, but every single one of them is coming out with lines of electric vehicles. I mean, there's a, there's an evolution taking place. Um, government Government's role is to... Uh, is to nudge and cajole and come up with policies that are going to help industries and sectors do what they should be doing when they might not necessarily want to move forward fast enough themselves. There's a hockey game going on tonight. And here's the example I always use. Um, somebody texted me, Montreal's up to nothing if anybody's interested. Um, but, you know, everybody says you shouldn't pay NHL players $15 million a year but then they had to introduce a salary cap because there's always one or two or 10 teams that are going to go ahead and do it. Everybody knows you shouldn't do it, but you need somebody to come in and regulate to stop you from doing what you know you shouldn't be doing, but you might do anyway. And that's the government's role when it comes to, to, to different sectors and the oil and gas sector. Um, you know, that's sort of the approach we need to take moving forward there, in my opinion. Yeah, well, is the hockey example really, a, you know, a good example? Um, well, no, I just figured it was timely, that's all. <laughs> with timely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, can we I, might argue, yeah. Can Ivan. I add something? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be brief. I, I think I think what I would say is, is I mean, there is, 
I think the folks who are here, you're all very knowledgeable. So I, you know, you're all probably familiar with the programs or the measures that are currently in place, right? So there's there's something called the output output based pricing system, right? Which is um, designed so there's a price incentive for heavy emitters to reduce their emissions and or to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And and perhaps there's a debate we could have, and that would be a whole separate meeting as to whether that's the appropriate measure, whether it's stringent enough. Um, uh, Etc. So that that's that kind of feedback I'm interested in hearing, frankly, uh, whether that's in this forum or by email or however folks want to reach out to me. Uh, but that mechanism is in place. So I don't want I don't want us to leave this this meeting thinking there's nothing in place. There are there are there is a sort of a, a price on pollution for heavy emitters, to put it simply, uh, already in place. The, the the second thing I'll say is that you know we're um, and James alluded to this we're you know, our economy is disproportionately reliant on the energy sector, on the oil and gas sector, uh, oil in particular. And so uh, relative to some of our counterparts, rather when you compare ourselves to other developed democracies um, in Europe, for example. And so the challenge that we face in, in, tackling, in tackling emission reduction is different than the challenge that they face. And they may have greater challenges in others because of other sectors that are different than ours. But but this is one of the things that is really difficult, right? Is how do we get our emissions down, but also protect, make that transition, a just transition as someone has texted in, um, and also protect, protect the, our, our economy because without a strong economy, we're not gonna be able to act on climate also, right? So just if, even if you're solely focused on climate and that's your, you know, and less focused on the economy, we need, we need a strong economy to be able to tackle climate as well. And so that's the, that's the kind of the, the the tension that I think exists and the struggle that that a lot of us who are in these in in, in Parliament and and in decision making roles or influencing roles in the case of Jamie and I, you know, are constantly struggling with. Um, let's uh, move on uh, to a related, but um, you know, using a using a different um, approach here now to the Paris Agreement. Uh, <clears throat> So we hear all kinds of math when it comes to, uh, you know, there's targets and, 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 and we're either meeting them or we're not meeting them. But um, uh, there, there's also, I think, a, a, a skepticism about whether the targets themselves are, um, uh, you know, and are, are, are strong enough or um, to, to save us, if you will, you know. As a as a planet and as a as a human race, um, and um, do, are there any sort of a, initiatives or is there some thinking happening somewhere about um, being a bit more aggressive with uh, uh, and showing some some leadership in the global community on the on the globe in the global scene uh, by Canada by being um, by, by, by moving the math up a little bit, by uh, reducing emissions faster? Are, are there possibilities that you can see? Do you want me to go, James, or? Well, let me just say this. No, actually, go ahead. Go ahead, Ivana. Yeah. I mean, I, I think just quickly, I mean, I think, I think the very quickly under the Paris Agreement in 2015, Canada committed to reducing our GHG emissions by 30% below the 2005 levels by 2030. Okay, so reduce our emission. Just I'll repeat that because there's a lot of numbers in there. So in, at, in our Paris Agreement, which many countries around the world signed, uh, Canada committed to reducing our emissions by 30% below what it was in 2005 by 2030. Uh, recently, and I, when I'm saying recently, I'm saying last month or uh, you know in the last month or so, uh, the government announced that they were going to increase that ambition. So basically, to go to 40 to 45% below the 2005 level by 2030. So um, what I would say is that that's my answer to your question, uh, Hans, about you know, what's in terms of increased ambition. I think you saw that from Canada, the United States, and a number of other countries around the same time in sort of a coordinated effort to sort of say, we're going to increase our, our ambition and the target, you know, or reduce or increase our ambition and therefore reduce the amount of emissions even further by 2030. Um, but I also, I, I also say, I also think for Canadians specifically, we talked about C12, right? And we talked about how C12 
re requires a setting of a target by 2030, but it also requires the government to, within six months of that bill passing, issuing a plan, which basically says, here's how we're going to get to that 2030 target. I think some of the questions you've asked and some of the questions I see in the text chat, and they're great questions, they're great comments, and they're all very fair, is around the how do we get there? Some of it's about the plan, but a lot of it's about how do we get there, right? You talked about the oil and gas sector. We talked about other measures like that. Should And, and I think one of the things that I hope this group and others uh, like you will engage on is that plan. Because it's really the plan that says, here's what we as Canadians, as individuals, as private sector, as government need to do to get to 2030. And that's where the rubber hits the road. That's the reality of what we have to do. And if you look at that plan and you say, oh man, that's we can do that no problem, then the conclusion you draw is, well, we should set more ambitious targets and we should push the 2030 target further. And if you look at that plan and you think, gosh, that's gonna to be tough for us to do for whatever reason, then you might say, ah, the target's in, you know, as ambitious as we can make it. And I think, so what I would, I would say to you is I think we should, I mean, as somebody who cares a lot about climate change, that's why I'm on the environment committee. Number one, yes, we have to push ourselves to set as ambitious as targets as possible, but we also have to set, but, but we also have to make sure that the plans that we set out to meet those targets are achievable. And, um, and I think it's by, once, once you see that plan, I think that'll be a great litmus test for whether our targets are too ambitious, not ambitious enough, or just about right. Those are my thoughts. So, so Ivan, how do you measure uh, if a plan is achievable? Like, like, like what, what are the, the mileposts or the standards or the, how do you measure that? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on which aspect of the plan it will be. So we'll see the plan, you know, when, as I said, after C12 is passed, the government will be required to issue that plan. Uh, but, but I think it depends. I, sus I don't know what's in the plan. I haven't seen it. So I'm not speaking from inside knowledge. But if the plan says, you know, here's the kind of reductions we're going to have to see from, for example, requires re emissions reductions from, here's the kind of, some of the changes individuals will have to make in their everyday purchasing behavior or everyday consumption behavior. I think that's something that as individuals, we could look at and assess and based on our own experience, determine whether or not we could do that. Some things presumably in the plan might require the private sector to do certain things, right? To take certain actions. And I think those who are who follow those sectors and know those sectors well, we better equipped to comment on that. So I think it depends on which part of the plan. Yeah. But I think we'll be able to evaluate some of those aspects based on our own individual experience. And then we'll have to rely on some experts who look at this to tell us, you know. Sure, but then, and what we often hear from, uh, from folks and, and from, uh, frankly from you folks is, you know, it's got to be realistic, um, but again, I, you know, how do you measure something about whether it's realistic? So, so for example, Can I jump you know, in here. We, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, James. No, I, I was going to say, look, these are these are perfectly fair questions, and the reason they're fair questions is because for so long governments have been setting targets and then not meeting them. So your first question is, how do you know these are realistic targets? And then the second question is, you know, what benchmarks are you going to use to see if you're meeting them? I mean, you're you're bang on. I mean, you know, go back to Kyoto, you know, Stefan Dion, who was the environment minister, he named his dog Kyoto. We, we were very yeah. proud of that, yeah. you know, but we didn't, we didn't meet the targets. And then the conservatives came in and, you know, uh, targets weren't met. You can go back, you can go back, you know, as far as you yeah. want. Anybody said targets, they weren't met. So it, the first question is, you know, how do you know we're going to meet them? And, you know, look, we just raised the targets from 30% to 40 to 45%, as Yvonne pointed out. I'm sure there was a lot of people. I'm sure there was people even on our side going, oh God, we're just setting ourselves up to fail again. You know, how can we do that? But the, there's an evolution taking place, in my opinion. If you go back 25 years ago, how much discussion was there about the environment? People say, yeah, yeah, the environment's a problem. If you go back then 15 years ago, it's a bigger problem. You, and it, you know, the evolution is whether you're prepared, you got to recognize it, acknowledge it, be prepared to do something and then really be prepared to do something about it. And I think we're at the point now where everybody is really prepared to do something about it. So the answer to your question really is, is look, look at the commitments we've made. Like I was sitting in the house of commons uh, when I was on house duty and it was about 10 30 in the morning and the prime minister walked into the house. I didn't know he was coming and he comes in and he, and he introduces the carbon pricing. And there was a lot of people going, wow, this is really bold you know, we're really going out on, on a limb. And you remember the pushback we got on this. And this is, a, this is the point about without power. The late great John Turner said, you know, ideas without power are meaningless. And if, you know, you can talk about things all you want, but if you're not in power and don't have the ability to implement them, then you know what, you're just talking. 
And if you look at the carbon tax for carbon pricing, for example, what happened? Our premier goes out and spends all kinds of our money on putting stickers on gas pumps. And he's got everybody scared that your gas prices are going to go up 30 cents a liter overnight. Well, what happened over the next 12 months? Gas prices actually went down. Gas prices are lower now than they were uh, before the, when the carbon price was introduced. So you have to do these things in a measured, realistic way, because if you don't, you're going to lose your ability to do it on the one hand. But back to the main point is, I think, and I honestly believe that we have we have introduced legislation now that's going to make this happen, but it holds us accountable because it's not a discussion you'd be able to avoid uh, in 2030 or 2035 when these when these time when these uh, benchmarks are, are reached and these reports come out from the environment commissioner it says, well, you didn't do this. It's not the government can't just you know stop talking about it and put it you know put it under the carpet because there's going to be an accountability measures that, that have been introduced in this legislation. So that's that's why I believe we're going to do it on the one hand, in conjunction with all of these other things we've talked about. And I think the legislation is going to, as for the benchmarks, I, like I, I Yvonne's right, again, you guys, many people on the call tonight probably probably know way more about this than we do. You, you, you tell us what, what the benchmarks are, how we look at this, and how we can decide whether something's going to be effective now, five years from now. I'd like to say I know the answer to that I not, but I believe we're at a point in time now where as a government, if two years from now, it's going slower than we thought, we'll do what we've done over the last six years. We'll up the ante and we'll take measures to make it more. I mean, this budget, we just put $17 billion into uh, green initiatives, jobs, and climate change. And again, it's cross ministries. It's not just um, the Minister of the Environment, which used to be out there on its own. You want to talk about environment issues? Oh, there's the Environment Minister standing over there. Go talk to him or her. Now, as you go talk to the Ministry of Industry, you talk to the Ministry of Finance, you talk to the Deputy Prime Minister, you talk to everybody because that is a lens we are looking through. So um, I might say it's going to be perfect and it's going to work. I'm not going to sit here and say, I guarantee you, but I'm going to guarantee you that uh, Yvonne and I and our colleagues are going to do our darndest to make sure that it does. And if along the way that it's not, we're going to take steps to change it. Okay, thanks, James and uh, Yvonne. Um, I'd like to uh, switch the topic a little bit, uh, maybe zero in a little bit closer to home. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned a moment ago things that our premier does. Um, you're going to have to work with provincial governments, and we've already talked a little bit about uh, collaboration. But, um, you know, when we're trying to collaborate, when, when you folks are trying to collaborate with uh, the provincial governments, it's, uh, we sometimes don't know, as citizens, who has the power. You talked about power, who, and, and, and who can overrule whom, and so on. One of the issues that we've been talking about a little bit in um, environmental um, concerns is, circles is, um, and, and it's been a it's been a local issue that's come up, and that has been the uh, the plans for the proposed highway 413, the the super highway, and the government is using ministerial zoning orders to kind of find that is the provincial government is using ministerial zoning orders to kind of uh, force its way um, through this through these plans and. Um, uh, you know, we're worried about uh, uh, taking over farms and and, and forests uh, to uh, build the super highway. Now, mind you, it seems to be somewhat on hold, but these plans seem to be um, pretty strong in the mind of our provincial government, and 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 there are concerns, and we wonder when it comes to um, those sorts of local issues, what kind of uh, power does the uh, federal government have and and uh, whether there's there's a will on the part of the federal government to sort of intervene and um, and and uh, do something about the situation like that Ivan you you were uh, we're in provincial government at one time <laughs> yeah. I was going to say it's natural that he starts here <laughs> yeah um, you notice there's some questions Jamie wants to take and there's some questions he doesn't want to take uh, so, so the, the, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, um, I, won't, I know we don't have a lot of time, you probably have other questions you want to ask, so I won't give you a long response to that, but I think there's a different, I will say there's a different elements to, un, 
there's a different number of different elements you alluded to that we could unpack in, in what you just said. Hans. Um, there's, there's a little bit about jurisdiction. There's a little bit of about environment protection. There's a little bit about evidence-based policy. And maybe there's one or two other things I haven't touched on. Um, the need to build infrastructure to support growing communities, et cetera, is probably a topic we could cover under that. So briefly said, I, I think the role of the, this is almost entirely provincial jurisdiction. Uh, Minister Wilkinson has, the federal minister of the environment, uh, did agree uh, to put it under uh, federal review. Uh, the, the, the technical term for that review I, it escapes me at this moment, so forgive me, but it is under a review by the federal government. The federal government does have jurisdiction uh, to, to protect certain species, endangered species, um, and a number of other things, and it's under that jurisdiction that, that Minister Wilkinson has agreed to perform a review of the 413. Uh, that, if that, and, and presumably if the, he does the review and the plan, the provincial plan is not, uh, does not comply with environmental protection laws, then presumably that forces the provincial government to amend the plan or postpone the plan or something like that, or, or cancel it. Uh, so, but we don't know what the outcome of that review will be. It certainly delays it because it's a step in the process that the provincial government must now, must now comply with. Um, but I think having been a provincial politician, for the most part, this is very rare where federal government gets involved in regulating uh, or overseeing, or in some way, um, I'll say regulating uh, provincial infrastructure projects almost entirely within the, the bandwidth of, or within the jurisdiction of the province. Okay, so we're on our own on that one. Um, does the federal government have any jurisdiction when it comes to providing some sort of guidance or regulation for distribution of energy across the country? So thinking now about um, you know clean energy, there's a, a huge amount of um, production in Quebec um, of uh, the generation of clean energy, but um, a lot of that goes to goes south of the border. And uh, in the main, meantime, in the Maritimes, for example, um, they, they're, it's hard to, uh, to, it, it, to find suppliers for energy, let alone uh, clean energy. Um, is there anything in, in, in federal legislation or, or sort of environmental planning that can address that issue? Uh, I'll take that one, Yvonne, if you want. Yeah. I'm, I'm eagerly passing it to you, James. <laughs> okay. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and in 2018, I believe, I'd have to look at the date, there's a report generated by the Natural Resources Committee on uh, electricity and strategic interties between the provinces. And that's exactly the question you've asked because every province is, is very much uh, on its own when it comes to power generation, for the most part. Part of the problem is, is you have, and so the purpose of the study was to try to see if there's a way we can go east-west instead of north-south, because you're right, because Quebec, for example, sells a lot of power to the states. Atlantic Canada sends a lot of power to the states. Um, you know, some provinces are short of power. Other power, other provinces have excess power. If we could find a way to to move that across the provincial boundary lines, that would be ideal. Particularly, particularly, where some provinces uh, are are um, generating clean power. You know, for example, you know, Ontario has a very very clean electric electricity grid. Um, most people think that's from hydropower. It's actually mostly from nuclear. About 60% of the electricity in Ontario is generated by nuclear plants. Um, the Maritimes, for example, is um, mostly hydroelectricity. Quebec is mostly hydroelectricity. But believe it or not, the capacity to move from, you know, northwestern Ontario to Manitoba and Manitoba to Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan to Alberta isn't as easy as you think. And there's two reasons for that. One, the infrastructure is different in many cases. And two, um, they have different uh, rules and regulations. So the whole purpose of the study was to try to see if there's a way to, to do that so that we can become more self-sufficient, but also benefit from clean. And again, the, the big focus with this is on clean energy. Because, you know, I remember, you know, 15 years ago working in my uh, office downtown and you know, on days like we had in the last couple of days, you'd look outside and you'd see these big, you know, look like brown clouds across the sky. And that was all from the, you know, as soon as we got rid of the coal plants, that all started to disappear. You know, so Ontario, you know, uh, Yvonne was part of the provincial government that did that. You know, that we have every reason to be very proud of that. But 
So there's the answer to your question, but it's it's not a simple case. And and you think about building the infrastructure, think about Northern Ontario. And this is another challenge we face as a country is geography. I mean, we have, you know, we live in Toronto, so you drive from Toronto to Mississauga to Oakville. But when you're driving from Thunder Bay to Kenora to Dryden to Winnipeg, you know, you're driving, you know, across Europe it's, and through rugged terrain. And so building the infrastructure that can go from province to province to province in some of these regions is incredibly expensive and then it comes down to okay who's going to pay for it province says well i don't want to pay for it to give manitoba power and then you know so then you get into this jurisdictional issue so that's that was the whole purpose of the report but it's it's on the radar it's something you know we made a series of recommendations in the report to to try to move forward on that but these things take time because you know governments look at these these reports and then you have to get in discussions with your provincial counterparts and and that's, uh, well, that's a, a challenge at the best of times, as I said earlier. Okay, uh, speaking of uh, your office building downtown um, and uh, buildings in general and, uh, and, and in Canada, our need to heat and, and cool them and so on. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, options for carbon neutral uh, heating and cooling of, uh, of buildings and uh, perhaps ultimately even in putting the buildings up, you know, when we're talking about the cement industry and so on. But um, is some thought being given to uh, ways to facilitate a kind of carbon neutral uh, infrastructure for, for heating and cooling and uh, some of our, well, our, our, our larger buildings in the country, let alone um, our, our, you know, people's have people's homes, private homes, and so on. Yeah, I can take that, James, if you like. Um, so um, there's the answer is yes. There's a number of, of programs in place. Um, I'll just briefly outline what's what's there. Um, so there's the the announcement that was. This is in regards to homeowners retrofitting homes, and this announcement was made just a day. James alluded to it earlier in our discussion. Um, so uh, this is called the Greener Homes Program. And, and so basically you can receive, homeowners can receive grants of up to $5,000 to make energy efficient retrofits to their, to their homes, their primary residences, I should say, and up to $600 to help with the cost of home energy evaluations, right? So you need to do an evaluation to determine where the opportunities are for, for retrofits, and then you need to do the retrofit. Um, uh, so that this includes things like replacing windows, adding insulation, sealing air leaks, um, improving heating and cooling systems, um, purchasing solar panels, things like that. Uh, so up to $5,000. And um, the another one, another a separate program um, is something that was announced in budget 2021, which proposes 4.4 billion to the, um, which would go to CMHC. So the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, this would help owners complete retrofits through interest-free loans. These loans would be up to worth, to, these would be up to these loans would be worth up to $40,000. So there's a $5,000 grant plus 600 if you want to do a retrofit. There's 40,000 in interest-free loans through CMHC. And um, those are a couple of the couple of the examples of sort of programs that are in place. And this would, you know, uh, there are, yeah. So these are some of the programs that are in place to, to allow retrofits in homes, but also the latter one would be presumably for commercial as well. Okay. Yes, some of the things we've talked about too is, I mean, the, uh, you know, government needs to lead by example. So we need to, and this is part of the study we did on the clean technology or part of the discussion we had on clean technology. Uh, you know, we're talking, we're talking a good game in Ottawa. We better do something about the buildings we all work in there. Right. So, um, and so that's what we're moving to do. So new buildings are going to be built that way. We're retrofilling old, old buildings that way. Um, and, and, uh, you know, this, this initiative today that Yvonne was just talking about, let's not forget the fact that this was filling a gap created by another level of government because there were similar programs like that available that were canceled. So we have had as a federal government to fill some holes, uh, not for, and I'm not talking about previous federal governments, I'm talking about current provincial governments. Um, so that's that's been one of the challenges we face too. But on you know on the uh, on the building infrastructure, uh, that's an, an important piece of the puzzle. And you know one of the things we we talked about doing was uh, using more wood in construction. 
because that's an, that's another area where uh, you know some strides could be made, and it's uh, it creates job, it promotes you know. Look, I won't even get into the forestry sector and climate change because that's we could have an entire discussion on that. But uh, in fact, we've got a report coming out on that in the next coming days too. So um, again, with a focus on on climate change. But the federal the federal building standards that's something that we've we've talked about and we're moving forward on and that's we have to lead by example. <clears throat> so during the COVID crisis, there was, uh, in some ways, a remarkable response by uh, by governments and by the federal government in um, uh, you know addressing the crisis and providing assistance and so on. So somehow we understood that uh, COVID was. Uh, an, an actual and serious crisis, uh, but you could argue that the climate crisis is uh, as serious as, as COVID. And um, so could you s envision any of the things that you're doing or proposing to do in response to the climate crisis as a kind of an emergency response? And, um, and it, it, is there a sense in government circles that uh, that something's happening on an emergency basis. Yeah, I can I can start, James. If that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. Like I and I and I I saw a comment from I think it was Jan. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch this. Oh, here it is from Jan Vanderwall, um, and she says, and this is along the lines of what you just asked. That's why I raise it. Um, please note, many of us think this is very urgent and want faster action. Maybe that needs to be part of the discussion at your meetings. I, that was the comment, one of the comments in the comment box. And so it ties in with what you were just asking us. And the answer is yes. Like, I don't, I would, I would hate for, for folks here to walk away. Like, I think we're being asked a lot of questions about what is the government doing? Um, uh, why has the government chosen this particular target or that particular measure? And so we're kind of explaining what that is. But I think, um, like, it's, I think if you, when I, I mean, I talk a lot with Minister Wilkinson, who's the Minister of Environment in particular, and his staff. Everybody's trying to figure out how do we push as much action on climate change as possible, right? Uh, and I think everybody is seized with that. I'm seized with that. That's why I wanted the Environment Committee to push us to go as fast as we possibly can. Um, and so I, the answer is yes, we treat it as an emergency. Um, I think most politicians of most political parties uh, do. Um, and so not all, but I think many do. And so I think that there's increasing uh, political support for more of that urgent action that folks are looking for. But certainly in government, in, 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 the, in the government ranks, yes, it's an emergency and we have to ask, act as fast as we possibly can. And I think, I think we're trying to do that. And I think we're trying to increase our ambition. We're trying to push the plan as hard as we can. Um, but again, I welcome feedback if folks think we, we're not doing enough. But that's, but that's, we're all trying very hard. Yeah, I, I would. I would just say, look, I agree with what Yvonne said 100%. I mean, is it a crisis of the same proportion? Yes. And you know, one of the things, she, and I, I'm, I know I've heard it many times, and I'm sure Yvonne's heard it, and many of our other colleagues is, okay, we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with a medical crisis, we're dealing with an economic crisis. You guys aren't going to keep pushing this climate thing you keep doing, do you? <laughs> you know, but this is just the skeptics who are using this as an opportunity to try to push back and stop us doing. But clim the climate uh, uh, crisis has been like so many other issues highlighted by COVID. You know, the, the, I mean, early on, I think I remember talking to part of this group, John was there and I know Tim was there. If you go back to, um, you know, this time last year, when people really did shut down and stay at home and nobody went out, there was no cars on the road and uh, very few planes were flying. I mean, you saw, you saw nature sort of fight back and rebound, you know, you remember, you remember the stories about uh, uh, the canals in Venice were suddenly clear again and there's fish in them and these kind of things. I mean, these are simple examples, but I think it, it showed a lot of people that humans do have a real impact on climate uh, in the negative sense, but more importantly, that we can have a real impact on climate in the positive sense. So, uh, I believe, and I hope, you know, many, many, many other people, I hope everybody believes that COVID has actually proven to peep the skeptics that we need to do something now more so than ever, but more importantly, that it'll actually have a positive impact. 
And if I could, not, not to, I know you want to move on, but I just, I just want to add to that quickly and it uh, will be 30 seconds. Um, like just, just to put some numbers and some facts to, to, that, to, to back up what, what I'm saying, I think James is saying too, but the government's invested since 2015. So over the past five, six years, government's invested about $60 billion towards climate action and clean growth, right? So six, six zero billion. So, um, and then in 2020, an additional investment of 15 billion for uh, the Strength and Climate Plan. Uh, another 15 billion for public transit in February, 2021. Um, an increasing price on pollution. Um, the last budget proposed to provide almost $18 billion towards a green recovery. So I just wanted to throw out those dollar figures to say dollars aren't everything and it's all in how you spend them, of course, otherwise it's not money well spent. But I think the point I'm trying to make is the government saying, these, this is, this is an emer since 2015, the government's been saying, this is an emergency. We need to put resources towards these different elements of the problem. So I just wanted to underline that as evidence of support that people believe it's an emergency and we're trying to put resources behind the actions that the government thinks need to be taken. Okay. Well, let me just add to that too. I mean, you know, we're, we're planning for post, post COVID, post pandemic, and we're talking about ways to, to boost the economy. Uh, and we're doing it through that lens again, through clean infrastructure, you know, shovel ready, clean infrastructure. Our, our infrastructure minister, uh, sometimes I'm, when I'm talking to our different ministers, I forget who I'm talking to because it's this lens that we're all, you know, all looking through. So it's, uh, people have, um, you know, it, it, it's there. People recognize this. We, we, our government is definitely on board and, and appreciates the severity and we're not, we're not uh, taking this crisis as a way to slow down. We're taking this crisis as a, uh, as a not an opportunity. Opportunity is the wrong word, but it, it reinforces that this is the right thing to do. Now, the federal government has um, a fair amount of jurisdiction and also relationship with uh, uh, indigenous communities. And um, I wonder if there's anything you can say about um, perhaps uh, gleaning wisdom from uh, Indigenous Canadians when it comes to um, kind of respect for environment and environmental issues. And uh, at the same time, you know, how are things going as far as uh, um, working on improving the situation in Indigenous communities as far as their own infrastructure goes and so on? John, I'll, I'll start if you want. Um, look, that's an, that's another um, it's another area that this government is. I'm I'm proud of the steps we've taken. Uh, it is not without its challenges, from basic things like you know when you talk about infrastructure in indigenous communities, clean drinking water is the most uh, glaring example. We made a commitment in 2015 that by 2022 we would have the problem solved. Our minister, Mark Miller, you, many of you may have seen comments he made about two or three months ago now that we've fallen behind our goal because we had make, we'd been making tremendous progress, um, but he'd fallen behind, but we're there now. I mean, it, it's, but these things, and I, I hate, I, honestly, I hate saying these, you know, things don't happen overnight, but what you need is the commitment to do it and then they'll follow through to make it happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen as quickly as you'd like it to happen or as you'd hoped it can happen, but as long as you're making it happen and we are, but that's, that's, that's one piece of the puzzle. I mean, and if you, if you look at the, the uh, challenges, the indigenous community faces in Canada, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges and clean water example again is, is geography. Canada is this massive, massive country. And I, you know, I've, I was born in Thunder Bay I moved to Tobacco when I was 11, but, you know, I went back there and spent a lot of time there. You're talking about communities that are, you know, from Etobicoke to Oakville in, in Northwestern Ontario, they might as well be a thousand miles apart. Like it's, it's, you know, infrastructure has a different meaning in, uh, in rural Canada than it does in, in urban Canada. Um, but again, uh, our prime minister said time and time again, he's, he's, com he's committed to improving the, uh, uh, lives of our indigenous community and working with them. And we've taken great strides. I mean, we had, was it last week? Uh, no, it couldn't have been last week. The week before Yvonne, we passed the uh, UNDRIP legislation. Um, so it, it's happening. It's happening. But it took us a hundred years, over a hundred years to get here. 
you know, to create the problem. It's not going to be a problem that we're able to solve in, in four years or six years, but we're moving, uh, we're moving on it. And it's, it's, I'm proud to say that uh, it is happening. Yeah, if I can just, and I can, if I can just add or drill down a bit on, on what James was saying, James was speaking broadly to our relationship with our First Nations people and some of the, some of the, some of the initiatives around um, improving quality of life for, for First Nations. But um, in the context of, of climate change, I, mean, I think there's two, just two points I'll make. One is um, in, in terms of like the government has publicly, I guess a few points. One is the government's uh, communicated its commitment to, um, to collaborating, collaborating, working with indigenous um, organizations and representatives on that, that plan, the, the plan that I refer to is called a healthy environment and healthy economy. Um, and uh, so, and there's a recognition by the government that, uh, and they acknowledge this publicly, that uh, there's a disproportionate burden of climate change on, on indigenous people. Um, that, and that it exacerbates like, existing inequality um, across health indicators and determinants of health. So there's an appreciation that this is impacting first, climate change is impacting First Nations folks disproportionately. That's the first thing. Secondly, there's a commitment to work with for, or, working with First Nations um, communities and representatives. Um, and so, and the, 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 the climate plan that I was referring to just a moment ago, which was released in December, 2020, commits to supporting um, indigenous climate leadership, ensuring that Canada's, um, the future actions we take on climate change um, help advance indigenous um, self-determination and address indigenous priorities. Um, and so, um, so I could go into more detail, but I wanted, that's, that's baked into and publicly disclosed by the government. So I wanted people to know that's a priority and then how that, much, how that actually translates into action is through, um, and I know about a number of things, I, can, I, I can't claim to know all of it, but certainly there's a lot of consultation with indigenous communities and the leadership of indigenous communities on that, on how to develop that climate change plan, uh, on the development of that climate change plan to make sure it achieves those goals I just mentioned. And the second point I'll make, second broad point, is that there's infrastructure programs, I won't go into the details of, but there's infrastructure funding programs that are available to help build uh, clean, low carbon, a low carbon uh, energy efficient, efficient infrastructure across the country. And this is available uh, not just to municipalities or provinces, but but it's also made available to, to First Nations communities as well to make sure that, that uh, we can address, uh, that they can build the infrastructure that they need to support the quality of life, but also to address climate change as well. Those are the two points I'll make on that. Thanks very much uh, to both of you there. So we have a couple of minutes left and uh, maybe just one more topic um, um, in the, in the uh, area of agriculture and um, you know, there's growing awareness about the environmental cost of, um, of agricultural practices, not to mention, um, you know, the consumption of agricultural pro um, products, in particular uh, meat, <laughs> you know. And um, I mean, we even we talked earlier about uh, about ben benchmarks and how you how, how do you measure what's real and uh, what's what's possible in reality and um, and, and, and what we might strive for ideologically. Um, so, so, so the consumption of meat would be an example of that. You know, you might say it's unrealistic to ask people to, or to try and uh, develop a culture of eating less meat. But um, I, I think it's been shown that uh, if we reduced our consumption uh, of meat and that would uh, impact agriculture, of course, um, it would uh, make a quite a lot of difference in um, in, uh, in environmental impact, <clears throat> and so these these would this would affect our cultural policy, of course, and uh, production of food and so on. Any anything to uh, mention in that regard, yeah. James? Sure. Uh, I mean, you're talking about cattle, right? I mean, and I I assume that's really your question. You're talking about beef. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, the number of times when I start talking about uh, emitting, you know, emissions, people often throw that back at me. Um, if you're talking about getting people to change their eating habits for that purpose, then um, yeah, I, look, it's got to be part of the discussion, but I'm not sure that that's, um, 
I'm not an expert on agricultural issues by any means. I, I, I living in Toronto and growing up in Thunder Bay, but I mean, I, I you know, it, it should part, form part of the discussion, as I say, but I'm not sure that that's going to be a, uh, one of the leading planks in this discussion. Um, but you have to be prepared to discuss it if for no other reason, because it's used as a defensive tool by so many to try to dismiss the importance of the discussion in my experience. And if I, if I, if I could jump in as well, I, I would just say, I think there's a lot, there's examples of a lot of things in our daily behavior that are causing harm to the climate, right? That are contributing to emissions. And you've described one of those things, but there are many, right? And the, you know, there's everything from the obvious, like, you know, the amount, you know, when you, from the, the emissions from transportation, from the emissions from uh, heating and cooling of, of buildings and homes, you know, so there's, 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 um, there are many activities in our daily lives that contribute to, to damaging our environment and, and to emissions. And so to me, when I think about that, that's, I'm of the view that, that if we, if we believe, if we set the right targets, emissions targets as a country, and we develop plans that are credible, objectively, independently assessed. And I don't just mean by the media, but I mean by the advisory panel by that we talked about, by the Auditor General, which is in, in, would be required in Bill C-12 and others. Um, and we believe in that plan, we believe it's an achievable plan. Then within that plan, there's the uh, there's a mechanism to get to where we need to go. And I don't know what that plan will say about specifically about agriculture or, or beef specifically, but I know that we're going to be required and the government's going to be required to figure out how we get there. Um, and, and those details will have to be, well, if, if C12 passes, will have to be provided. But the other piece of it is, is that I think that a big part of the plan is I think the price on pollution. It's, and the ever increasing price on pollution, the carbon taxes it's often referred to. Because to me, that's the primary mechanism. That's, to me, if, if we set the targets, we bind ourselves to meeting them in law. And then to me, we continue to adjust that price and pollution up uh, until we get there, until that forces us or incents us, I should say, to change our behaviors. And so presumably an, an appropriately set price and pollution on, on activities that harm, that, that, cause, that lead to emissions will contribute to an increasing cost of certain products like beef or uh, like gas at the pump or other, and that'll for that'll incent us as individuals to change our behaviors. I think that's the goal of the price on pollution. And so, to me, I'm I'm of the view that if we believe in that mechanism, and if we believe it creates the right incentives to generate the right behaviors, then I think we don't have to worry as much about the individual choices that people are going to make about buying gas or eating beef or whatever. I think we can believe that we're going to, as a country, in the combination of decisions that we're gonna make is going to be incented by that price of pollution. And if that price of pollution is high enough, is set properly, it'll incent us to reduce our emissions collectively in the ways we individually choose um, to get to the goal that we need to get to, which is net zero by 2050. So that's how I see it. Yeah, good. Well, thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Ivan. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a combination of um, uh, folks um, having the incentive to act individually and as a community agreeing together on how we're going to motivate ourselves to do so. So, and, and in fact, I think that's been the purpose of our, our um, conversation this evening is to discover, um, you know, strategies for, um, for, for, for motivating ourselves as individuals and as a community. And uh, we didn't intend this to be a kind of um, a provocative uh, session of raising questions that uh, where you folks had to defend yourselves. So we appreciate very much your openness in uh, entering into this uh, conversation in an open way like that. And um, so I'm going to thank both each of you for joining us this evening and all the other folks that um, are with us. Um, we've probably had lively conversations. Some of it I've seen myself in the chat room. And that in itself has been a very valuable. And uh, to wrap up the evening, I'm going to invite uh, Tim Ellis, who has um, uh, been instrumental in our committee, to uh, to finish up our session. So I'll pass it over to you, Tim. Thanks, Oz. 
Um, I want to start by thanking uh, our MPs, first and foremost, MP Baker, MP Maloney, uh, for taking the time out of your schedule to join us tonight. I know you're busy, even in the best of times, in the middle of a pandemic, probably not the best of times. So uh, I know there's a lot for you to do. Really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with us. And I know it's also not easy to sit in the hot seat and answer questions. Um, I've been in districts where reps, you know, phone it in or don't even show up. So really do genuinely appreciate you taking the time to, to be here tonight. Uh, also know that not everyone's question got asked. There were many great questions. So we do intend to pass around not only the recording of this meeting, but also the list of questions to the MPs and to the attendees. Uh, and also you can always reach out to your MPs directly. Uh, and given the great quantity and quality questions, I'm sure we'll look to schedule another check-in uh, later this year, perhaps. I also wanna thank uh, Mimico Residents Association, Ecolinks Etobicoke, Citizens Climate Lobby, and Green Pack, and all of the organizations that have supported this event. Uh, I wanna thank Cora, Carol, Alex, and John for all your hard work in putting together the logistics of this event and making it happen. Uh, I wanna thank Hans for hosting. Uh, you make it look effortless, but I know it's not, and really appreciate you bringing those skills to make tonight a success. I uh, also want to thank everyone who came. Uh, I am really proud to see such tremendous turnout for a climate town hall here in Etobicoke. Uh, you know, I first learned about the climate crisis, I must have been like fifth or sixth grade. I remember my science teacher talking about global warming and the greenhouse effect. Remember that? Uh, I was like 10 years old. I'm going to be 40 this year. Uh, I have lived my entire life under the shadow of this crisis, literally every day. Uh, every long term plan I've made. I've had to factor in an existential global crisis. Uh, when I talk about starting a family with my partner, we have to agonize over whether it's even worth the risk. Um, here's the thing, in 1991, when I was 10, you know, we, had, we had rich and powerful people, we had national governments, we had climate science. We had plenty of people in 1991 who were in a position to fix this before it got bad. But here we are. Uh, we didn't just lose that chance. Like it was kind of stolen, but I'm not a doom and gloom kind of guy. I have a lot of faith in humanity, uh, but I'm not naive and I can learn a lesson. And I think one thing I've learned over the last 30 years, I'm not gonna count on anybody else to come save us. If we're gonna beat this, it's really up to us. Uh, it's up to me, it's up to you. Uh, and I do wanna be clear, I'm not trying to sell our elected representatives short. I truly believe that they're here tonight because they wanna do the right thing. Uh, I truly believe they are elected to this position because they do want to do this job, be part of the solution. That's really important. I'm glad we have that on our side. At the same time, we know it's, it's a measurable fact that our current policies are, are not yet enough to get us there, not yet. So I told you I'm not a doom and gloom kind of guy to prove it. I'm gonna close with a bit of good news. And the good news is this, we have something now that we didn't have in 1991. And that is, this that is an informed committed growing global movement of regular people who are drawing a line in the sand and saying okay enough is enough no more delays no more denials no more generations forced to grow up with the specter of this global crisis uh mp maloney you said earlier that you find yourself in the middle of competing voices you got a group on one side screaming slow down and you got a group on the other side saying speed up and it sounds to me like the constraints you're facing here are not technological they're political and what's missing has been this exact thing, this groundswell of regular people demanding change and making sure that the voices shouting speed up carry the day. So that means it's our job here to sustain that and to grow it. So I'm gonna wrap up by asking you to do just that and telling you how, but before I do, I have one last piece of really good news. We have a uniquely powerful role here because if the kind of all encompassing transformation we need is gonna happen, it can't just work in downtown cores. It's gotta work in places like Etobicoke. So we have the chance here to set an example for the entire country, an opportunity to make Etobicoke a national leader in climate action, the greenest and most sustainable neighborhood in Canada. So here's how we're gonna do that. Uh, tonight's town hall was the collaboration between many groups. It was also the first event in a new coalition, I guess, uh, which we're calling Etobicoke Climate Action for now. We could change it if we have to. Um, this was just the start. We have more action planned. Uh, starting next week on June 3rd, there's a workshop focused on local individual action people can take right here to make a difference. I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now. Uh, and that chat, uh, that link is gonna 
be here. I want you to click that link. And when you do, you'll see a little form. And when you fill that form out, it'll plug you into the new group and make you part of the solution. So I'm asking you to do that right now. Because I do, I do believe in us. I believe in humanity. And because we do have what we need to make this transformation happen. We're gonna change everything. And that means we need everyone. So fill out the form, get plugged in. We'll follow up with you and we'll get to work. We deserve it. We deserve hope. We deserve joy. We deserve our future back. So fill out the link, fill out the form, let's save the world. Uh, I'm gonna throw in some music, give you some time to finish filling out the form. I wanna thank everyone again. Thank you, especially uh, to our MP guests, MP Baker, MP Maloney, and, uh, and the team that made this happen. And I'm looking forward to working together. So fill out that form. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Tim, and thanks everybody. It was a great evening. Thanks everybody. Thanks for organizing this and thanks for being here. Appreciate all the feedback and questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everyone.
again, everyone. See you next time. If you're on the core team, please stick around. Uh, Cora, Carol, uh, Hans, Sandy, John. We'll uh, we'll do a little debrief. Everyone else, we'll see you soon. <laughs> a few left. So can you keep quiet for a minute if I unmute myself? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't take this the wrong way. If you are not part of the team that planned this, I am going to gently remove you from the Zoom. It's certainly not intended to be a rejection of your presence. Just going to have a little debrief. Um, and I'll save you the rest of your evening so we can do that. So um, please do log out, but I'm gonna start booting you, um, but it's by no means permanent. We'll see you at the next one. I've put them in the waiting room. I'm going to pause this. Uh, stop. <laughs>